sidetracked very easily. Right, Rob? How, how long have we got? <laughs> Until they start logging off. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let me introduce to you guys uh, Rob. What's your last name? McCullough. <laughs> Rob McCullough, he and I go back, uh, actually, when I started my employment here back in January 93, um, he was very grateful. Huh, another mineral processor. Because he was employed by the Montana Bureau of Mines and he was basically the only mineral processor that they had over there. Um, and it was sad to see him uh, leave the Bureau. Um, but everybody needs to change every now and then. But I keep inviting him back, particularly for this class. He has got some world-class experience with small mining companies, particularly gold operations. And you could say it applies to South Dakota, because it does. But most of what he's done has been in, at least with the Bureau, has been in small gold operations in Montana. But he does have outreach to Idaho and Nevada and whatever. So without any further ado, Rob McCullough. And I will do my best to not put you to sleep if I possibly can. <laughs> and, and you'll have to excuse because sometimes things just don't work out the way we had planned. Um, so you guys are going to college. I'll give you a little reference of college 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. There weren't any jobs. Damnedest thing. So I'm a, a <clears throat> I'm a fisheries biologist. Does that sound like a fun program? And when I reached the end of that lunacy, <clears throat> I remember looking at my uh, the guy that was the head of the department and said, "Okay, so I've accomplished this. Now what the hell's available for jobs?" And he says, "Well, there really aren't any." Uh, he says most of our graduates either sell drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals or black market drugs. There's more money in black market, but you go to jail. <clears throat> and so about that time, a friend of mine said, <clears throat> hey, we got some jobs over here with the U.S. Bureau of Mines. Uh, why don't you come work for us? And so I started working for the U.S. Bureau of Mines out of Spokane in wilderness areas, evaluating hard rock mines, placer mines, anything you can dream up. So I went back to school to get a degree in geology. 75, I'm one class from graduating, <coughs> and I'm a little smarter than I used to be. And I said, hey, what are the jobs? The guy goes, God, I'm really sorry, but the entire industry collapsed last year, and there aren't any jobs. It was sort of like, OK, what the hell do we do now? Does this all sound familiar to you? <coughs> and so one of the guys in the office says, well, we haven't been able to hire a mining engineer um, since 1945. Why don't you go back in that? We can hire you off the street. So once again, <coughs> I went back and started in mining engineering from scratch and worked my way all the way up through the middle of that. And when I, <coughs> I think when everything come done, I did 10 universities in 12 years, <clears throat> and some of those I changed every quarter uh, because there was ways that I could go one in the, in the winter and one in the spring and have a month in between, and in those days, education was sane, and tuition was $251 a semester and books were 150 bucks, and I could earn that a month. Uh, so <clears throat> I feel for you guys. And what they do now, you ought to be allowed to shoot one instructor when you when you graduate, <laughs> just to make you feel better. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> one of the things that I did was that for 12 years I evaluated wilderness areas with 205 other geologists and engineers, and we mapped and sampled upwards of 750 mines per team. Uh, every year. I worked 
mother load in California for all the plasters, all the tertiary uh, stuff, uh, a lot of the hard rock operations, southeastern Oregon, or southwestern Oregon, northeastern Oregon, awful lot of Idaho, most of Montana, uh, Washington. <clears throat> like I said, I've, I've pitched a tent in some of the damnedest places you've ever seen, and that also included southeast Alaska, where we camped with grizzly bears and flew helicopters every day, and I lived through that one. So <clears throat> we'll just share with you some of the things that I've run out and what we come up with. And I'll give one story, and I promise I won't do too much before after that. <laughs> I had a lady come into my office one day, <clears throat> she's about 75, and she said, you know, Dad died last year in a nursing home, and he was a geologist for the Anaconda Company, and there's a bunch of stuff here that I don't know what to do with. And so I sat down with her, and we went through all the stuff, and there was, there was some, uh, he had a couple of pigs uh, that hooked into the pneumatic lines for running a jack leg, and a bunch of other odds and ends. And we talked, went through all those different pieces of equipment, explained what they were and how she could sell them. And then she said, do you know anything about rocks? And I went, yeah, why? And she says, Dad packed this damn rock. And it was, oh, 14, 15 inches long and maybe a foot wide. And it was black. And <clears throat> she goes, we packed this through South America. We took it to every place you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> and he would always put it on the front porch. And it kept the screen door open. And he'd never let us throw the rock away, no matter where the hell we went. And I went, OK. I said, but well, what is it? And she goes, I don't know. Well, you just kept it painted black all the time. Now, you got to remember. In 1941, it became illegal to own gold. <clears throat> and so I said, I said, can I hit it with a hammer and see what kind of rock it is? And she goes, yeah, what the hell, I was going to throw it out anyway. So I pulled out a hammer and I hit it. It didn't chip, but the paint came off. It was a 300-pound gold nugget. And since it was against the law to own gold, he had carried this with him and kept it on the front porch. <laughs> that way nobody ever asked what the hell it was. They, she kind of remembered they got it to South America, but she really cussed the damn thing until she found out that it was solid gold. <clears throat> so you see a lot of strange things. When I started to, to write, <clears throat> and I give you a, a little reference. Before I got too senile, um, I was teaching some classes in Arizona for the National uh, Center for the BLM. And <clears throat> I taught most of the patenting classes on, on the plaster, plaster lines. And we didn't have a handbook. And so the guys said, you know, we ought to put together a book. We had a guy from Alaska that came out of the Arctic District. One of the guys that was in Arizona, so we learned about desert plasters. And one of the guys that, I'll show you a picture in here. And we came out with a, uh, a book uh, <clears throat> available over here at the Montana Bureau of Mines. Um, they're $25. I don't get anything out of them, but it's a really good reference. And uh, if you buy it from Amazon, it's 75 <laughs> Have you read it yet? Yeah, it's running. No, have you read it yet? Uh, no, not much. He buys two of them, and he won't tell me what the... What there the is a lady in Southern California who has health problems that one... The, you know that book you signed for me? Yeah. I basically, one, one night on my live stream, I just made a note of everybody that, you know, put a thing. And we drew a number out of, out of thing. And so, uh, there, they say, there's a lady that's having some health problems that was very, very happy to have won that book that you signed. And I want to thank you very much oh, for that. No problem. <laughs> uh, 
chapter five in there talks about different recovery techniques, what works, what doesn't work, and the rest of them are anything you ever want to know about plastics worldwide. So just as a, as a cheap reference from your library, as you go through college and the library gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if you have any interest in, in gold or sapphires or that, that's a good place to start. So in the middle of that, <coughs> I asked Corby, Corby Anderson is now at Colorado, I said, what do you got that, that uh, talks about different mineral processing gravity techniques? And he pulled out all these books and we must have gone through 10 or 15 of them. And this is the only one we found that talked about sizes, and what works and what doesn't work and why. I'm not saying that it's everything, it's just some. And a lot of times some becomes really important when you have none. <clears throat> Little things. Okay. On sluice boxes. Sluice boxes are, are an interesting thing. I've seen the most screwed up things you've ever seen in your life. I've been in Alaska where they loaded sluice boxes with the dozer and there was 18 inches of water and the rocks were coming out over the top of the box. Um, some of the best research on that was done <coughs> by a guy in the Yukon and he got a grant to do it. And he found rather than, and I'll show you a bunch of boxes, that are probably five, six degrees. What he found really worked is that you, and it's in the book, you put about a two inch space between the riffles, lean them back at 15 degrees and tilt the box down at about uh, 15 degrees. <clears throat> you can't believe how the gold comes out of the system and goes into that. And then you half that slope and go to expanded metal. And all the fine gold that didn't stay in the first batch will set up in the second batch. And so in two parts. But the key on a lot of these is you have to understand the deposits. I'm working with, the, with camp now, trying to understand the gold in a load deposit. <clears throat> Placers are the same thing. There's a size distribution curve. And in all of Alaska, I believe there's only two or three deposits that uh, <clears throat> have coarse gold. And so, in, in, when you get into some of this equipment, it just makes the assumption that all the gold is this size or smaller. Well, in those, it was a big scar deposit, and it had lots of coarse gold, and it puked out chunks. And so now you find in the prospector's group that they're up there with metal detectors picking the nuggets out of the top of the reject in the top of these piles. So one of the things I always worked with is first understand what your deposit has. And if it has a lot of coarse gold, <clears throat> then do a size distribution curve so you understand what you're going to get out of it. If it's thumb size gold, you don't need something that works in microns. <clears throat> and if it's microscopic, well, about two thirds of everything they got can go away. Now focus on that size or break it up so you recover it in different sections. So the coarse gold comes out here and the medium gold comes out here and the fine stuff comes out here. Understand the deposits. Now, in the tests, <clears throat> last time they, I never quite understood the system, there's, I put together some questions and some of those are a little harder uh, in that because we can't go through them completely. But when you, when you get into these deposits and you understand what they are and how they are, then you're going to have to have a treatment on a bunch of them. A lot of Montana, Idaho, uh, near source type placer deposits have never had an opportunity to break down. And so what comes out of them is a nasty, gummy, sticky, rotten crud. You dig it up. I've, I've dug some of it out that you couldn't get it out of the bucket. Entertainment is an excavator bucket with three fools 
usually overpaid trying to figure out how to get the mud out the middle of it. What one of my guys found was that if you dug it out in the fall and left it in the pile, it would slack over the winter and you could feed it directly to a marsh plant. If you dug it out in the summer and fed it to the damn marsh plant, it stayed a lump and you couldn't get it to separate. So the characteristics in each one of these deposits you have to understand to be able to get recovery. So not only do you need to know what the individual equipment is, but you have to know what you've got to do to that. You know, if it's a hard rock, you're going to have to crush it. How fine? Uh, if it's a plaster, do we have to let it slack? Do you have to figure out where the rocks are? There's characteristics in every deposit, and it comes with a multitude of things you have to compensate for. Is it really easy? No. <clears throat> One of my favorite sayings, and, and it fits, is <clears throat> misery is when you pay your mother-in-law to live with you. And, and if you're stupid, <clears throat> you'll pay your mother-in-law to live with you. It's, it's just what it is. And deposits will do those kinds of things. So you have all these different choices. Each one of those is going to be dictated by the deposits you're working on and what characteristics are there. And so when you talk about treatments, you're going to have to prep that deposit to be able to get the recovery. Anyway, so <clears throat> this is a run-of-the-mill 1930s large plant. They worked. They were relatively <clears throat> cheap to build. They were indestructible. And to begin with, they were all fed with a drag line. That's why they're so high. Today, the guys have 54,000 pieces of conveyors and all kinds of crap. This thing moves a, moved about 35 feet every four hours. And so you can do concurrent reclamation behind you and your bonds go way down. <clears throat> um, tough part, look at the angle of that grizzly. Lost of these things was standard, was you were in rocks. Spacing was about eight inches. <clears throat> so where did all those rocks go? Well, they go right there. So you end up in a pinch that you either have to hook the teeth on the, on the uh, bucket on the drag line to pop those boulders out, and then if you're in a, a pay street with a lot of coarse rocks, then you've got to be able to go down there and pluck all those rocks out with that excavator, or with that uh, drag line bucket, so you can move forward. <clears throat> if they designed that thing to have an A-frame so the rocks went off on either side, you would have cut down your time by quite a bit. Second part, any one of these things has a big problem. I've seen in the screen, punch plate, they pick a size. Well, what you, you're trying to reduce the volume. Normal situation in a placer is about 50% is oversized. Well, <clears throat> if you're really excited and you make holes that are only a half inch, but your goal is an inch to 